Antlers was co-written and directed by Scott Cooper, and this is coming from the short story The Quiet Boy, which was written by Nick Antosca. And it's also coming to us from producer Guillermo del Toro, who of course brought us the Academy Award winning film The Shape of Water. Only this time we follow Julia Meadows, a school teacher played by Carrie Russell, who along with her brother Paul, the town sheriff played by Jesse Plemons, together begin to suspect that this uh, recent surge of missing persons cases and, and mutilated bodies that are showing up around the town seem to be connected all to this one student of, of uh, Julia's named Lucas Weaver. Immediately, I'll say this. It's neither one of the best nor one of the worst horror movies you're ever going to see. Rather, this is a solid B-level horror flick. And that's totally fine. I mean, for the most part, you get what you're coming here for. Um, there's a lot of strengths. There's a lot of good things about this movie. Unfortunately, I think the sort of, uh, the ending ends on a sort of rather, uh, it ends on a lackluster note for me. And that sort of brings the rest of the movie down just a notch to where I don't say that this is going to be like a B plus or an A minus type of horror movie, but it, you know, it's a solid B and it, it's executed extremely well. And, uh, there's a lot of good things to talk about here. So we're going to go ahead and highlight a lot of the strengths before we circle around to the weaknesses and then wrap this thing up in a neat little horror flick bow. So this is, again, a spoiler review. So if you've seen the movie, you're totally cool. If you haven't seen it, I would suggest you should go watch it and then come back to this video and we can talk about it together because, again, there's a lot of good in this movie. There's certainly a lot of good direction. And the story is something that's uh, worth watching as it unravels, as the mystery sort of unravels. But, um, again, uh, let's just go ahead and get right into the strengths because there are some weaknesses that sort of bring this movie down for all the strengths that it does have. From the first frames of this movie, when it begins, we're treated to some gorgeous cinematography that lasts throughout the entire flick. And this is beautiful work by Florian Hoffmeister, the cinematographer of Antlers. And, and you know, I think this really lends to the uh, tone and atmosphere that we see throughout the rest of the movie with this small coastal town, small, you know, coastal Oregon town setting that we have here, you know, with, you know, the fog that seems to, you know, blanket the entire town to the, you know, the the pitch black mines, the, the scary uh, large trees and the lakes, you know, this is a perfect setting where, you know, some crazy stuff's going to happen. And um, that, that all has to do with tone and atmosphere and, you know, setting the aesthetic that you want as a director. And so I think Scott Cooper nails that just perfectly, you know, no complaints here. This looks and feels like you're in a horror movie and you can easily get settled into this universe and you can easily buy that this is a real, you know, this story of the Wendigo is something that would actually happen in this world, just based off the way they set things up and the way they frame a lot of the shots. The, the shot composition in this movie, you know, a lot of the things that we see, whether it's, you know, stuff at the corner of your eyes or, you know, just beautiful imagery and getting a sort of a, a feel for the scale and the size and the, 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 of the Wendigo in particular when he's uh, being framed on camera. You know, it's a lot of beautiful camera work. And so that definitely deserves some praise. And I'm going to give it that totally here. That's, there's nothing I think wrong on a technical level of, of filming this movie and, you know, working the camera. Another thing that I really liked is the story and the actors and the two leads that we have, again, with Jesse Plemons and Carrie Russell. The, the brother-sister dynamic, while we don't go too deep into uh, their backstory and uh, their history together and sort of their dynamic, we get enough of it for the most part, you know, a lot of surface level stuff and, and some, some, some moments where we get like little flashes and like half flashback moments with these characters with uh, Julia in particular, where, where we learn that she's a, you know, a, a victim of both uh, sexual and physical abuse from her father. And we learn that she had to run away to sort of get away from things. And she moved to California to become a teacher, but she left her little brother, uh, Paul, behind. And this is something that she feels guilt for. And ultimately, when her father, uh, as she uh, reveals to uh, Lucas, uh, you know, that he killed himself, and that decided, you know, she decided off of that, okay, now I'm going to come back to, to come live with my little brother because I miss him. But when she comes back to the house, there's a lot of, there's a lot of bad memories there. There's a lot of bad vibes. Just, you know, that of her, it reminds her of her old life that she's trying to move on past from now. But, you know, with the, with the events of this film, a lot of that stuff is sort of creeping back into her life. And we see that with her battling her alcoholism. Many times when she goes to the store and she's, you know, we see the temptation there where she wants to get a drink of alcohol. She wants to buy some. She never does it, thankfully. Uh, good on that character. It shows that she's got a lot of uh, strength inner strength within her and it's why she's the perfect lead uh, character for this type of story and juxtapose her with Paul her brother played brilliantly I think by Jesse Plemons he's a very different character um, their brother and sister dynamic you know works I think because he's sort of more of a straight man 
you know, he, he wants, a, he thinks more uh, logical, logically, I guess I want to say, you know, he doesn't believe in the whole myth of the Wendigo and, you know, we get surface level again, hints that he's also dealt with some trauma from his father and just overall things happening in life. But it's more sort of subtle with him. You know, it's not like in our face, but there's enough there that we can get a sense that something definitely happened to him. And, and he says as much to uh, Julia that he misses, that he missed his sister. And every day he prayed and hoped that she would eventually come back to him. And she does. So uh, the acting again is, is very well done. The characters are pretty likable for the most part. Lucas was another character who I thought uh, was written uh, really well or uh, well enough. And the, the acting on that kid um, forget, I'm blanking on his name right now, but he did a tremendous job, I thought, as well. He had to certainly um, sell a lot of moments of fear. And it's hard to do that for an actor, much less a child actor. So, you know, huge ups on him for, for nailing that, for the most part, I thought. Um, and the character of Lucas is one who gets a lot of layers, and I appreciated that for this story. You know, it's usually sometimes when you're following kids in horror flicks, it's kind of, uh, sometimes you start to lose interest or the acting's not always there. But here, that's certainly not the case. And Lucas is a good character. And, and going back to the story, I think he's given a good story. And even with the opening, uh, opening sequence to the film where we see his father uh, and his little brother get essentially their soul is sort of overwritten and infected by the Wendigo curse. And we, you know, we get a great reveal when we find out that Lucas is feeding both uh, his little brother and his father both uh, human meat. And the little, the little boy doesn't want to eat the human meat. But we see that it's make, the sickness is still taking over him. And we eventually get a, you know, a very uh, tragic ending with his little brother's character. And I think that having that sort of reveal early on in the film where we find out that, whoa, this, infe this infected Lucas's little brother as well. I think that that gives us great stakes for this character going forward throughout the rest of the story. So that's all good stuff there. Um, again, a lot of strength in this movie. The, the tension... The suspense that build that builds throughout the entire movie. I mean, man, masterclass. I want to say, uh, great, great tension, great suspense. You know, a lot of moments where it's just sort of quiet and characters thinking about things and 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 like, wait, did I just hear that? Like, what's going on here? Then there's some really like intense moments where we see things like the principal of the school going to uh, Lucas's house and you know just getting my goodness mauled to death by the. Uh, half human sort of turning into wendigo form of lucas's father and that's another highlight is the makeup uh, and vfx man um uh, bravo team everybody who worked on that in that, in that makeup department that vfx department you know hats off to you because he genuinely looked creepy he looked really cool in a sort of weird you know horror fanish way but also, the Wendigo design at the end of the film, too, was sort of having the human flesh mask <laughs> over the antlers and the huge, you know, half, you know, human antler, deer, deer, monster creature vibes going on there. It just, the design of the creature looked really cool and it looked really scary. And I'm certainly glad that uh, it looked good for, for you know, just sort of uh, smaller budget that this film had. Um, so, you know, again, hats off to everybody there. These are a lot of the strengths of the movie, but... Uh, the weaknesses, which I'm going to get into right now, uh, sort of derail a lot of that stuff for me. Uh, going back to the to the to the excellent buildup of tension and suspense throughout your film, when you do that in a movie, typically as a director and writer, what you want to do is reward your audiences for sticking with you the entire journey. And at the end, you got to just go swinging for the fences. You got to give them a show. And unfortunately, I feel like the ending uh, with the Wendigo, where this is another strength before we get to the ending, is the Wendigo, every time his, he, he was on screen, his presence was felt. And you felt scared for the characters. You knew nothing good was going to come of it, of this encounter. And, you know, you expected bad stuff to happen, and it wasn't going to end well for anybody who wasn't the Wendigo. But in the ending, it just feels like the Wendigo was taken out a bit too easily for my liking. Maybe it doesn't bother other people as much. But I just sort of feel like, you know, for such a huge character with such build up and suspense and myth to this character for him to be taking out in less than two minutes of screen time by just getting uh, stabbed by a large uh, pole that was on the ground uh, and being blinded by a, a light that we had seen uh, other characters like Lucas' father use in the beginning of the film. It just feels like there's something missing there and it feels like there's sort of a uh, sort of a plot hole there 
where he wasn't infected by the light in the beginning of the movie, but he's infected by the light at the end of the movie, and he's taken out by some steps to the heart by uh, Julia's character. It just feels a bit, it felt a bit rushed to me, and, and, and it sort of took away a lot of the believability that you spent so much time building up the rest of the film. So I just wish that ending maybe felt a little bit different. And um, I also want to say, going back to uh, Jesse Plemons' character of, of, of Paul, I feel like there's a missed opportunity there with when you have a character who who doesn't believe in things. He even says he even says as much when he has a line of dialogue or, or a line with uh, his sister when he's talking about one of the mutilated bodies that you know, hey, Jesus wasn't here for this. If he was here, he wouldn't. He wasn't here for this. So, someone who doesn't have that faith and that belief uh, anymore, it, maybe he had it once, but he's lost it now. I think that that makes for you know you have to do that. Uh, moment where a character like that has to face something that he just completely disagrees with. He just, he cannot comprehend it, but we miss that. You know, he does have an encounter with a Wendigo, but his back is turned to the Wendigo the entire time. So he never truly gets that eye to eye moment where he realizes, okay, I'm wrong. This is real. This is, this is in front of me right now and I got to deal with it. We never get that. So I feel like that's just a, a missed opportunity for some good drama in your movie. And I also don't like the uh, the ending reveal at the end where it's like, uh oh, uh, Paul is sick and he's uh, been inherited with the Wendigo curse, and now he's going to turn into a Wendigo. Um, I always kind of don't like endings like that where it's like it feels like you're sort of you're not going all the way with it. Either give me a good ending or give me a bad ending. But when you sort of meddle in the middle there. I don't know. I just feel like stories, for the most part, shouldn't end that way, and it bothers me. Again, maybe it won't bother most folks, but it bothers me. Uh, one slight, uh, one slight note that I also wanted to make, in case anyone else out there notices this, notices this as well. I, I found some of the editing choices to be a bit clunky. Uh, especially one thing that sticks out to me is when Lucas uh, stabs uh, the Wendigo, I guess, in the heart. There's a quick cut to it, but then we go from a quick cut close up to a, uh, a, a sort of a medium medium wide shot of uh, uh, Carrie Russell's character looking at the Wendigo. And it's like, wait, what just happened? And But then of course the Wendigo drops and it's like, oh, okay, Luke is stabbed him. But maybe I'm just dumb, but I just feel like from a technical standpoint, when you're structuring your film uh, in, in post, maybe it's just something that didn't, uh, it didn't really feel like it flowed well to me in terms of the, the sequencing of that scene. And there's some other little moments like that for the rest of the film. Maybe people won't catch it, but you know, be, me being a film student, I just sort of, I sort of look out for that sort of stuff. But yeah, Antlers for the most part is a really good film. It's solid. It's it's not great. It's not bad. You know, it's right in the middle. And I appreciate movies like that. And I wish we got more movies like that. And I was the only person in my theater watching Antlers, so that was a bit disappointing. Hopefully, uh, those of you who have seen it and are sticking with this review so far, I know we're gonna we're going kind of long here, but. I hope you enjoyed it and, you know, let me know in the comment section below what you didn't or did or did like about this movie because I'd be very curious to hear what you have to say. Uh, Christmas is soon around the corner and I'm going to be doing a video essay on Krampus, the uh, Christmas horror flick, horror flick by Mike Doherty. So stick around for the channel on that and if you uh, are intrigued by that concept, well, I have many more video essay uh, videos on the channel where I cover movies like uh, rent a Pal, Jeepers Creepers, Stranger Things, Anaconda, you know, you name it. I'm the horror guy for you. So if you like this content, you want to stick around and subscribe and support the channel, hey, go ahead and do that. And I'd be very appreciated and thankful towards you. But until next time, this has been Millennium Movies. And I'll see you all very soon.